It's, that's our cue. So uh, good evening and welcome to the July 22nd, 2021 meeting of the Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority Board of Directors. A quorum is present and we'll begin. Uh, first item up is to approve the agenda. Can I have somebody move that into the record? Jesse, seconded by Kyra. Uh, per the new rule, uh, when you vote yes or no, make sure you state where you are calling in from. So um, uh, your, city, your uh, city and county. Uh, so we'll just go down the list. Uh, Raymond. Uh, here from Exmoor, Virginia. <clears throat> and you're a yes on the agenda? Yes. Okay. Jesse? Uh, yes, from Ypsilanti, Michigan, Washington County. Oh, my man. Kathleen? Uh, yes, uh, calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Washington. Okay. Susan? Uh, yes, Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County. Kyra? Yes, Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County. Ryan? Yes, and southbound US 23, uh, let's say north of Genesee County. Good enough for me. Uh, and I'm also a yes calling from uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Washtenaw County. Did I miss anybody? I think I got it. Okay, uh, we'll move then with the agenda to public comment. Uh, anybody who wants to address the board as three minutes, please state your name for the record. Uh, Keith, and, and uh, once again, if you are calling by phone, please press star nine to indicate you wanna to speak to the uh, board. If you are zooming in, uh, please click raise hand button. So Keith, do we have anybody who wants to address the board this evening? Thank you, Chairman Mahler. Yes, we do. We have Mr. Jim Mogensen. Mr. Mogensen, you've been unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So this is uh, Jim Mogensen from Ann Arbor in Washtenaw County. And um, so uh, bylaws are, bar are boring until they're not. And I have some concerns about some of the bylaw changes, but we'll see how it goes. And the second is uh, related to something that I think has come up and it's on the, on the agenda as the, as the gold ride, I'll call it the gold ride issue. And that is that um, one of the features of AATA is that its uh, financing is even more complicated than transit funding usually is. It began when there was a problem, when there was a, a private bus service from Ypsilanti to Ann Arbor and um, city council no longer wanted to deal with all these little bills that came up when they tried to help make that sort that out. So they created the AATA. And then there was the millage in 1973. And so over time, the uh, idea was that yes, it had expanded beyond Ann, uh, Ann Arbor, but the amount of money raised was more or at least provided additional money for extra services, which is why Senior Ride was limited to Ann Arbor. So as the visioning in recent years has expanded, this created more problems. So I just kind of bring this up is that there are people in Ann Arbor who have been expecting some of these other extra things that were outside things that were funded by uh, federal money, state and federal money. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, plays out because people are starting to take the bus and needing these services more and they're starting to call me up. So I just wanted to let you know that there is that stuff that that kind of buzz is starting in the community and you may begin to hear uh, more feedback. As always, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Keith, do we have anybody else who wants to address the board? Yes, we do, Chairman Mahler. We have Robert Pulowski. Mr. Pulowski, you've been unmuted. Good evening. Can you guys hear me well? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, great. Uh, Robert Pulowski calling in from Southgate in Wayne County. Uh, first thing I'd like to start off with is Route 42, MacArthur, Michigan. Yes, it's a temporary route, but there are service changes coming in place as 
everybody that rides uh, the ride service knows. So currently this route drops off. Um, there's two stops currently, Clark and Ridge and Holmes and Ridge that I have some concern with. Now Clark and Ridge, there's um, a bench sitting there, right? And there's also some grass sitting there. Is there a way we could get some pavement or um, some cement right in that area? Because when it rains, that grass, to, you know, it gets all muddy and it, it's it's a mess. And I would like to see some pavement or um, some cement at the Clark and Ridge stop. Holmes and Ridge. Now that stop, I was just on that route uh, Monday of this week. And when I got off, it dropped me off literally at the in the sewer, right in the ditch when I got off through the back door. Is there a way we can get that stop instead of before it turns, it can go a little bit farther when the bus when the bus turns after it turns it picks up the passengers instead of before it turns um after picking up the passengers because i i literally almost tripped and fell right in the ditch because it was that you know uneven when i got off the bus and i'd like to see that stop be relocated after the bus turns because it, it makes a lot more sense um now the third thing i brought into uh, earlier this year about your guys's fleet now, the Washtenaw. Now, with the ridership growing, and it's going to keep on growing when the service changes come into place, it makes sense if you guys, are you guys looking into articulated buses? It makes a lot more sense to get the articulated buses on Washtenaw or these high populated routes than these old Gillig's that there's barely enough capacity to even fit the rush hour crowd. Are you guys looking into articulated buses? Because that route, especially Washington, Washington needs it, especially with rush hour and all the traffic that goes down there. I'm just curious on that. And I'd like to see the articulated buses on the Washington. And I'd like to see some more in the system than the current fleet we have, you guys have now. Um, to conclude, um, I just want to give a big thanks. Uh, I wasn't able to go out to the art fair. I heard it was a really nice one, but I'd like to give a big, you know, to all the drivers, I know it wasn't that bus friendly throughout the art fair with all the detours and everything for all the riders trying to get all the, you know, trying to find which stop is which. I just want to give a big thanks to um, everybody that was pulling through, you know, all the traffic and the headaches through the art fair with it not being bus friendly. And I want to give a big thanks to that. Uh, last thing, I want to give a shout out to all the ride employees for Getting through this pandemic, uh, getting through this pandemic, especially three employees, uh, Lisa at Industrial Highway Main Office, and uh, um, Valerie and Christina at Blake Transit Center. Those three employees are going to bring this system and customer service to the top. They are top notch. They are awesome. They, you know, every time I go in there, it's always a great conversation to have with those three employees and. You know, I hope to see him years to come working for the system because that's going to bring up, you know, customer service big time with employees like that and all in a good in the same kind of employees all across the system. So I want to give a big shout out to them. And, you know, it's well done. The system is growing and growing and growing. And with the service changes and the ridership, it's going back to where it needs to be. And, you know, that's what I'd like to see. Thank you. And we great job. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sims, go green, go white. I see that pillow in the background. Um, have a great day. Take care. Thank now. you. Bye-bye. Keith, do we have anybody else who wants to address the board this evening? No, we do not, Chairman Mahler. Okay. So we'll close the uh, public comment and move on to 1.3 general announcements. Uh, I think we have a couple of general announcements. First, uh, I want to introduce our newest board member, Susan Pale, who is uh, making her debut with us. Uh, I'll let her introduce herself, but she was uh, recently the executive director of the Downtown Development Authority. Uh, but I'll live, let her maybe introduce herself, give her a chance to talk about her background. So Susan, go ahead. Thank you very much, Eric. I, I uh... Look forward to meeting all of you on the board and looking forward also to working with you. I have enormous respect for the ride. The agency has been, I think, at the heart of a lot of the success of downtown Ann Arbor. 
And uh, for my 25 years there, among the projects that give me most pride was the creation along with the city and ATA of the Get Downtown program and the Go Pass program. And annually we knew we were diverting more employees into transit and away from the parking structures so much so that we, did, we were able to contain our construction of the new garages. Uh, it also got us a downtown that's walkable, vibrant. Uh, those downtowns that gave themselves up to parking, I think would do a lot to get to where we are. And we owe a lot to the ride for helping us get there. Uh, we are connected. Um, and this is the other part to get downtown. We're not an island. We are connected throughout the county, uh, Ipsy Township, Ipsy. And I hope eventually we we do more because uh, what AATA brings us and brings our downtown is the influx of employees. It brings us customers. Uh, it brings us uh, basically the lifeblood of a, of a city. So that's just a little bit about me. I love transit and I look forward to learning as much as I can about this agency for what I know, I know it's just a piece uh, just from my side from the outside. So thank you and, and thank you for the welcome. Thanks, Susan. Uh, any other general announcements from the staff or the board? Yes, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Brian. <clears throat> so we're, we're having some technical difficulties at the moment with video, but I would like to introduce to the board our newest manager, uh, Mr. Don Bolin, he is the manager of bus operations and has been with us now for three weeks and very happy to have him on board. Ah, there we go. And we've managed to talk through the video issue. Uh, Don comes to us from Kansas City where he started as a driver and worked his way up. And I'll let him just say uh, a few words of hello. Hi, good evening, everybody. Borden. I am honored to be here and what a privilege it is to uh, serve the community of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. And I'm looking forward to the building the relationship and how we can better serve our citizens. Other than that, I'm pretty uh, short, uh, short winded. So anyone have any questions for me? Well, thank you, Don. It's good to meet you. I'm sure we'll uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll be able to meet you and, uh, and Susan and everybody will we'll see everybody in person. Uh, then we'll be able to get together again uh, sooner rather than later. So we'll look forward to working with you. So I look forward to that as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. Any other general announcements? If not, we'll move to our consent agenda. We have uh, minutes from the last uh, general board meeting, committee meeting reports, uh, and then also a, uh, a signer approval for the Bank of Ann Arbor for our new CFO, Dina Reed. Uh, can I have somebody move the consent agenda to the record? Kathleen, seconded by. Kyra? We'll just go down the list then. Uh, yes or no on the consent agenda. Raymond? Yes. Ryan? Yeah. On you, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Jesse? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Susan? Yes. Kyra? Yes. And I'm also a yes, so that is approved. Thank you. Then we'll move to section three, policy monitoring and development. Section 3.1, uh, committee meeting discussion. Uh, our two committee chairs aren't here at the moment, but anybody want to have any discussion anyway or talk about anything that was in the committee meeting reports? Okay. Uh, then we'll move to 3.2, which is the bylaw update. We uh, had this in our packet last month. Uh, and had some discussion in closed session. We have brought back both Mel Muscovitz, our attorney from Dyke McGossett, Rose Mercier is also here uh, to talk about this and uh, uh, the next item as well. Uh, hopefully everybody got a chance. There was a marked up uh, edited copy and also a clean copy for your review in the packet. And I guess I'll open it up to see if there's any questions, comments or concerns about uh, the draft uh, leaving over from next month. So I'll open it up to board members to the floor. Kathleen? 
So a clarification on the treasurer's role. Uh, I remember last year we had talked about uh, eliminating the treasurer role. So it's my perception. I'm going to kind of give you how what I'm perceiving from the document. So the treasurer is just now basically a figurehead within the board because the treasurer duties will be mandated to the CEO for staff. Uh, and then the treasurer would only fulfill uh, attending governance committee meetings. Um, is that because the treasurer role um, is part of the Articles of Incorporation with the City of Ann Arbor, so it was just easier to leave it in instead of eliminating it altogether? Generally speaking, yeah. So the um, it's not just the City of Ann Arbor. We would have to go through the City of Ypsilanti and Ypsilanti Township to uh, take care of those Articles of Incorporation. This is a way to uh, delegate. We think the resolution that we've provided uh, that's been carefully worked on for a while by Mel and Matt, myself and others, uh, uh, takes care of the delegation of the role, the duties, which are, you know, simply have been, as we all know, outgrown by the treasurer you know, itself. And it is being done by the, by the finance and administration team uh, for quite some time now. Uh, and yes, it's just easier procedurally to make this delegation. It's legal, uh, it's fine, and we don't have to go through the really uh, tough headache of going <laughs> through for every city council in our jurisdiction to get them to amend the bylaws and, and ask why we're doing this, et cetera. So um, I don't know if anything, Mel, you wanna add anything to that, but that's, that's the general high level overview. Primarily, the duties of the treasurer are set out in the Articles of Incorporation. Uh, uh, the the articles are the Articles of the Ann Arbor Area Transit uh, Transportation Authority, uh, and that would would require uh, an elongated process for revising them. If you look at those duties, uh, virtually all of them are ones that are kind of discretionary. Uh, you know, you know whether. Uh, they only have to be done if necessary uh, or if uh, uh, applicable. And so if you go through them, uh, virtually none of them uh, would have to be per performed. And that is part of the resolution of, that would be considered uh, after if the bylaws are amended. It's just addressing that acknowledgement that some of them, the, the duties are not practical and maybe even be impossible to perform or are more readily performed uh, by staff, uh, either by the CEO or someone with his direction. The treasurer would not be just a figurehead. The treasurer uh, will, is on the finance committee and will probably be chairing the finance committee. And uh, the board and the finance committee uh, will be uh, integrally involved in financial issues uh, to make sure that there is the proper oversight. Uh, this was a very important consideration uh, by the board, by the governance committee, and we, we're building those uh, safeguards in place. And we'll continue to do that uh, maybe with some new perspective uh, by Dina as she uh, uh, gets acclimated to her position. I appreciate all the clarification. Thank you so much. Thank you. Raymond? Yeah, I um, have a couple. Um, I, I, discussed this at our um, uh, committee level, a uh, couple suggested changes that I would make when this is up for a vote uh, for continuity's sake. Um, the first is under, sorry, I'm scrolling through the document trying to find <laughs> my highlights here. Um, there is a section about where the um, board rec can recommend removal of a board member to the jurisdiction um, for, for consistency sake, I'm, I actually suggest that we, so it's section three removal from the board, the board may by majority vote of currently serving board members recommend removing that the member to the jurisdiction that appointed the member. Um, I'm going to suggest that we raise that to 60%, which is consistent with section six, um, which talks about, uh, 60% is needed for such actions as, um, uh, affirmative vote of at least 60% of currently serving board members is required to adopt or amend the annual budget, hire or terminate the CEO, or adopt labor contracts. So 
to me, the recommendation of removal of a board member, member feels to be on par with those other actions as well. So that's one issue um, that I will propose when this is up for a vote. Um, the other that I wanted to bring to your attention is, um, you all have heard me and I, I won't revisit this issue too much about my concern about Robert's rules of order may be relied upon and I understand why the argument is there. But again, for consistency's sake, this is under section 10, where it says the board may rely on Robert's rules of order. My understanding is the reason we wanna do that is in case we don't follow Robert's rules of order, we don't wanna be called out on a parliamentary uh, technicality. Um, if I, I think a similar um, approach should be applied then to section 11, which talks about policy governance. Um, so it talks that you know, the board has adopted policy governance as a model. This model shall govern. I would propose that we say it may govern. Um, so again, there's just consistency between how we're applying one set of rules for the operation of the meeting and how we're applying policy governance as well. So um, I just wanted to put that out there and make sure everybody is aware of what I'll be proposing at a future time when this is up for a vote. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'll react just quickly to what Raymond just said. Uh, first of all, on the 60% of the, you know, what it takes to uh, recommend removal of a board uh, member. And I think that's just recommend removing a board member to that board member's governing body, that jurisdiction, whether it's the city of Ann Arbor, city of Ypsilanti, et cetera. Uh, I don't have a, I don't generally have much issue with that. Uh, you know, with 10 members, it's going to take six, you know, anyway, which is 60%. Uh, with if we bump up to 11, you know, a majority of currently serving uh, would take, you know, six out of 11, just under 60%. If we went up to 12, you know, we would take seven, which is, I think, 60%, just, just over six, just, just over 60%. So it's a, it may be a distinction without a difference, but you know, it would only make a difference if we had kind of that odd number of board members to which you know we needed to to adjust that. But I understand that. My my only concern with it though is, um, um, do we do we take a chance on manipulating the vote, so to speak, uh, if somebody is abstaining? If somebody is absent, uh, if somebody is in transition, whatever, uh, and you know, we automatically uh, so put it this way: let's say the city of Ann, you know, everybody said Eric Mahler, you're a terrible board member. We want you out. You can presume that Eric Mahler will vote no, right? So that's one no. Uh, if anybody else abstains and you still need sixty percent, now you need six out of eight people. So if you have one automatic no. One abstention. Now you need six. Now you need seventy-five percent of the votes, right, uh, to get to get to that sixty percent mark. And you know, presumably, if I if I voted yes against myself, I would just resign, right? So it, it you know that that that's kind of a that's kind of a non-starter. So you know that sixty percent may be a hindrance at some point. And I'm not kind of arguing either way. I could live with sixty percent or currently serving majority board members. It could get complicated given the fact that presumably the person that we would be looking to remove would vote no against themselves, right? So it's already kind of at a heightened standard given that. The other thing I wanted to mention was, I'm sorry, Kathleen, do you have a, on that point, do you have a question? I had thought that I had read in the, article, the new bylaws that uh, if we were looking at a removal uh, from off from an office position or from the board recommending to the city councils or whatever that we remove this board member, I thought that the person that we were talking about was not allowed to have a vote. Did I read that incorrectly? I don't recall seeing that. Um, maybe I'll, I'll check again or Mel can look into that, but I don't recall it. I don't recall seeing that. Uh, I guess the other thing on the... Um, uh, the, the Roberts Rules of Order, the may and shall, uh, a couple of things. One, you know, we don't want, we don't want two shalls or two mays because that would leave a question of which trumps which. And Roberts Rules of Order, I, I left as a may instead of a shall. That was my recommendation only because uh, 
you know, we could go to Shell, as you, you know, as you pointed out, Raymond, but, you know, I promise you within a couple of board meetings, we get real sick of Robert's orders real fast, right? Trying to go through the, the black letter law of Robert's rules of order for every single vote or every single motion or every time somebody wanted to say something strictly adhering to Robert's rules of order is, is a painful task. So it's supposed to be a general guidance for us in terms of something we can refer to for a parliamentary issue. Uh, but generally speaking, I, I, I understand your point. You know, the point would be, are we strictly following, following policy governance to the letter of the law either? Uh, and if, do we want to live with shall there? Um, so, you know, does somebody want to call us out for that? You know, I don't know, but it would be, you know, policy governance would be a, you know, an internal system that we would use for governance that we could, you know, uh, shift to our needs as opposed to Robert's rules of order, which is used just at a meeting or a board meeting or a committee meeting uh, that somebody could upend with a, hey, you didn't follow Robert's rules of order. You know, you said you would do that or you shall do that. So therefore this vote is not, you know, legitimate or it's not valid. So uh, th those are my concerns with that. But if you if you have a really strong you know, preference to go shall or may for both, I, I just wonder if we would have a, you know, we can talk about that more. I'd be interested to hear more board member opinion about it. Uh, I'm just worried we need one system to trump the other. And I, I don't want to live with Robert's rules of order forever and a day. That, that's painful. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and I think I, I I maybe disagree a little bit with the assertion that we can't have two maze. There there are two separate issues, right? One is from how you run a meeting, and the other is policy governance of how we kind of structure our, you know, ends, means, executive limitations. So it's mm -hmm. it's not like policy governance is how we're running a meeting. That's that that. Mm -hmm. So my only point is is if. <laughs> If we don't want to say shall Robert's rules of order, and I and I agree with you, you know, if we've, we've, you know, I've conceded on this point. I I think a shall does become onerous and cumbersome, and as we've all discussed, most people don't follow Robert's rules of order even when they think they are. So I'm fine with keeping Robert's rules of order at May, but again, the the issue that I bring up is if we are turning that from shall to may because we don't want to be um, tied up in some, you know, parliamentary issue, someone calling us out that we didn't follow Robert's rules of order to the T, um, then I think the same argument could be made for policy governance. There are times where we probably stray from policy governance. And I would hate for, you know, that argument that you use against Robert's rules of order as a shall, in my opinion, my vantage point, could also be made against policy governance. If we drift away from policy governance or we overlook something one time, can someone throw a flag at us and you know, uh, call the vote invalid? So I, I just feel like if we're taking a more protective stance to give us a little bit of liberty to make sure that you know, we're carrying on with business um, as we intend and don't get caught up on a procedural technicality, then I think they should both be made. So that, that's, that's all I'll propose um, as an amendment. No, I, mean, I, 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 I get it. Here's my concern with leaving policy governance as a may, which is it's, it seems like because we've structured our whole governance structure around policy governance, we don't wanna make it easy for someone to say, hey, look, it's a may, we don't have to use it this month or we may use it next month, but we don't have to use it this month. I, I'm, because we've structured everything around that, I'm, I'm, I'm very leery about leaving that as a may, i.e. optional for future boards. And, and so I would, I think, weighing the pros and cons of both. Yeah, I, I, I fully see what you're saying, uh, but I don't want to make it easy for future boards or you know, especially a chair of the board to say, yeah, I don't feel like following that this month or I don't feel like, you know, or the chair, you know, or the CEO says, yeah, I don't feel like following that. You know, we're going to opt out of that this month and bring it back next month. So it's, uh, I, I, I fully get what you're saying. It's, it's just the, it's, it's, I just want to make sure we understand that future boards understand that this is the way. And if they want to get rid of policy governance altogether, they can amend the bylaws, number one. Uh, and it's not an optional thing that they can do month, month to month. They can take a vote to, you know, take it away. Power, do you have, any, you have something up? You have a hand up? 
Yeah, I was going to say, would it be, would it make sense then to just lower the threshold a little bit that we could leave it as shall operate under policy governance, but instead of having the threshold to change it, being amending the bylaws to have a majority of the then serving board or 60%, some of the other language that we have in other areas of the document. I don't know if I would would you know address Raymond's concern and kind of be a compromise on this. I see. I was talking on you. Uh, so were you saying um, drafting? Uh, I'm sorry. Say that again. Like 60 percent to get rid of policy governance or change it to something else, like putting that language in, or yes. So that the it's not as difficult as amending the bylaws if a board decides that they want to use a different gov different governance model. Um, but we, we, we could, although I'm not sure that gets rid of the problem, because even if we stick a 60% in there, I think we would still have to say the board may or shall or is or will be using policy governance, but can change it with a 60% vote. So we still have to have one operative word in there for either we, we are using it, may use it, shall use it, you know, something like that. And, but I'm trying to think of a way to make it a separate issue i think you can still say shall but then the th the last paragraph or the last sentence in that section um instead of saying adopting an alternate governance model would require amending the bylaws that's where you could put a different threshold in so the default would still be shall raven were you going to say something i'm sorry The way it's written now. Yeah, yeah. I, um, Carrie, I appreciate. Go ahead. Mark. The um, the governance model can be amended uh, by uh, uh, you can amend. The, you know, the board can vote to amend the governance model, uh, but to uh, adopt an alternative model, it would have to, as it's written, uh, amend the, about the bylaws. So, I mean, you can change that if you wanted to, but there's, there's, two, there's two different things, either amending the model, which would only require a vote of, uh, of the board. Uh, and because it doesn't say what that vote would be, uh, it would be the default of the majority of the currently serving board members, or, uh, uh, or you could amend and change the model, you know, change to a different model, but would have to be amending amending the bylaws. Right. Uh, right, and, and that's kind of what I was getting at. Um, it is we we our policy governance is already adopted policy, so we can't deviate from it willy nilly. It's already it's our policy. Right? I mean, it's adopted. So if we were going to deviate from it, we'd have to vote to deviate, you know, we'd have to change it, we'd have to adopt something different, we'd have to move from it. So again, all I'm trying to do is take the same argument of putting ourselves in a corner with shall and giving us the latitude that if we goof one time and I call a means an end or an end a means, you know, I just want to make sure that we don't, you know, someone doesn't call us out and say, you know, no, you're wrong. Cause we, we, even though we all are better versed at policy governance, I do not consider myself an expert. There are times where I think I might be following policy governance and I may not be. So that's all I'm trying to do is just for the same argument we're making for Robert's rules of order, make that same sort of argument for policy governance. To me, it seems pretty straightforward and pretty, um, you know, if, if we, I'm not suggesting we throw away policy governance because it's already adopted policy. We'd have to take that on as a separate vote and a separate issue and a separate you know, action entirely. It's just about that operative word giving us the latitude in case we goof. Jesse? And maybe, I, maybe Chair, I could ask you the question. Uh, what do you see as the difference if, if you think having shall in front of Robert's rules of order puts us at risk 
how does not having or how does having sh not having Shawin, um in front of the use of policy governance, which is you know also an operate you know a framework under which we're operating, not put us at a similar risk? You're asking me or Raymond? I, I guess I'm asking you. I think I, you know, I think Raymond has you know, I, but I think you know Raymond and I kind of have the same question: is like why is the shall a risk in one place and not in the other? I, I don't feel like that's been explained. Yeah. Well, I mean, as I said before, I don't. It's not that it's a not a risk at all. Uh, but when I weigh the balance of the pros and cons of putting it there, what I want to avoid is looking like policy governance is optional in some way. We may follow it. Yeah, we've adopted it. But when we say we may follow it, somebody sometime is going to say, you know, I don't have to follow it for this particular thing because it says we may follow it. Uh, it's to me, it's no different than if you know the president takes an oath to say, I mean, this is kind of an extreme example, but you know, I swear to uphold the Constitution, but he or she, you know, uh, you know, does something that is later overturned as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, they don't violate their oath of office by you know doing what they thought was best under the Constitution, even if it's later deemed to be unconstitutional. So, uh, the shall, I, you know, you know, even if somebody says, "Hey, you shall follow policy governance," and to Raven's example, somebody says, "Oops, you goofed," and you know, I I see policy governance working this way. Uh, will anybody tag us for a good faith effort to follow policy governance? You know, perhaps not. Um, and uh, you know, as long as the model is there, you know, I think what the, the operative language is meant to be, we will have the policy governance system in place. And we're going to govern ourselves accordingly. Govern to the the board of directors is going to govern itself with it, and govern the agency with it. Not to hamstring every you know single piece of of you know the policy governance uh, doctrine uh, for every single thing we do. So is it a risk? Probably a little bit. Do we invalidate any of our actions that we might take by? going off script here and there? Probably not. We could do that with Robert's Rules of Order. That would be my point. If we have shall in front of Robert's Rules of Order and we don't do a vote the right way, somebody could say, you didn't follow that. Uh, that action you took is invalidated. I don't think they can do that with policy governance if we, if we leave shall in front of policy governance. Kathleen, did you have I'm just wondering if uh, Mel has weighed in on his perception because obviously the document has been taken care of by an attorney, but I'm wondering if Rose may have any thoughts on this conundrum because it applies to policy. The question is with regards to policy governance. Do you have any thoughts, Rose, as to shall or may and the, this discussion that we're having? I think what, what putting this in the bylaws does as a board is to, if you will, set a standard for itself to say, it, it, essentially what I see is that you've invested a tremendous amount of time and energy and, and money into finding a way to govern yourself in a way that's effective and efficient and, and enables you know, accountability to, to owners. So I think, it, you know, when you when you entrench it in bylaws, it basically says, you know, we don't want to make it easy to just throw this away, you know, on a whim. And it's not a question of, you know, the application of it from time to time or various pieces. That isn't where it shows up. It shows up more in the, you know, the work that you do around, you know, around policies and using policies and the process of, you know, how you how you assess organizational performance, etc. So I just you know, I see it as, as essentially trying to say, I guess, protecting the, if you will, protecting the efficiency and effectiveness of the governing system that you've put in place. So I, I think it's, you know, it's less likely that, you know, someone's, that someone's going to say, well, you're not using policy governance because let's face it, that's probably not going to happen, <laughs> you know. Thank you. That. Other dialogue? Go ahead, Raymond, you do off mute. I'm sorry, Kathleen, were you done? 
Oh, yes, I'm done. Raymond, do you have something else? Susan, go ahead. There we go, I'm muting. So I had a question, it was a very small one. It has to do with voting, just to get clarification. It speaks to that uh, majority vote of board members present, provided a quorum is present. My question had to do with the content around conflict of interest and people abstaining. So let's say we have uh, six members showing up, but two of them have conflict should the voting section of bylaw speak to the minimum that is required? We speak to it later on as regards to amending the budget, hiring and terminating the executive director and so forth. But on all the other items, for instance, as we get to construction, uh, we may have conflicts. Uh, just, I, I wondered if, there is, if it's helpful to have a minimum given that there may be conflict of interests that will recuse people from speaking. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good question. The, uh, the one that hasn't uh, come up all that often, I, don't, I can't remember the last time it has. Two, I think the language we've, the preferred language we've chosen to go with is majority of currently serving board members. And that's kind of the operative language. So if we have nine, you know, we need five. Uh, and yes, we could have an abstention or two or something like that, but we would still need five because currently serving board members, you know, for instance, right now we have 10, uh, we would still need six as the majority. So even if we had some absences, we would still, the threshold would still be the same. So uh, the, the currently serving board members operative language kind of establishes that for, for us, as long as we have, you know, we're not down, you know, three or four board members. Uh, I think there might be, I, I can't recall, uh, without going through it, but there may be some votes we take that just limit us to uh, the majority of the quorum. And in those cases, uh, I think we've probably, I can't remember which instances those are, maybe Mel can help me out. But I think in those instances, those would be uh, administrative enough in nature that we weren't, we wouldn't be too concerned if we, you know, for instance, just had four members passing some something into the record that you know is, is generally administrative in nature but I can't remember if we have uh, any of those or if we've we've deviated uh, from the currently serving board members operative language Susan let me address uh, uh, or ask a question it, if there was the lowest level of vote is a majority vote of the board members present provided a quorum is present uh, so if, if you had uh, six members would be a quorum, uh, to pass something with six members, you would have to have four votes. Uh, if there are, as you pointed out, two members who aren't voting because they have a conflict, that doesn't reduce the number of votes you need. It reduces the number of board members who are able to vote and get you to the four. So, uh, I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Uh, it doesn't, it, it, you know, it's still gonna be a majority who are at the meeting, assuming there's a quorum at the meeting. So. Um, uh, I think and, Susan's point is we could still pass a resolution that only had four people, right? Out of, we have 10 currently serving board members, a, a minimum quorum of six shows up, four out of the six could pass a resolution, you know, when, only 40% of the board members actually approved it, uh, but we're down several board members. I think that's, I don't want to put words in Susan's mouth, but I think that's the point she's getting at. And I, I don't know how, in how many instances we, we draw that language. I can't, I can't recall, but where did, where did, what section did you see that in Susan? Do you recall? This is section six voting. And uh, I, I raise it only because my previous role, we had instances where we had a couple of board members who might coincidentally each have a conflict which would recuse them, then that they would have to abstain from participating in voting. Uh, so we, we ran into a couple instances where it, 
it was a question that could four people speak for a board of 10? I guess that, that, that is really the, the question. And it may be that we need uh, to not worry about it because this agency doesn't have that happen very often. So uh, this really may not, this may be a moot point. Well, I think you're, I think the point you raised, uh, that issue applies across the board. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's a good issue that you raise. Uh, you could have six people at a meeting with no conflict. You still only need four votes. Mm -hmm. but, but there were three levels of votes required. Uh, a majority of those present, uh, a majority of the currently serving board members. So, you know, depending on, you know, so for example, removal from the board would require a majority vote of currently serving board members. So if only six people were at a meeting, and you wanted to remove someone or recommend removal, all six would have to vote for it. Mm -hmm. And then there's the third level, the highest threshold is the 60% uh, uh, of the board. So, uh, and that might be, uh, a, you know, the majority depending on, on how many currently serving board members you have. But your point about a, well, an action could be taken by four would apply whether or not there's conflicts. Yeah, and I, I think that 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 section six, Article three, section six, that that uh, the new Article three, section six that Susan's were pointing out to us, that's that's the fallback position unless otherwise specified in the bylaws. So I think again, throughout the bylaws, what we've said is, generally speaking, we'll have the sixty percent if it's a really high level thing. We want to have a high threshold for. I think almost all the rest of them we have, you know, currently serving board members. So we have that kind of operative language. And I think that was meant to be a catch-all if unless we have, you know, you know, in other words, we have to have a quorum person and a majority of that quorum, you know, has to carry, can carry the day unless we otherwise specify. But I think if you go through these bylaws, you'll see that we've used pretty liberally that currently serving board members language. So, uh, you know, it would take five or six or, you know, seven people, generally speaking, that that's meant to be a catch all. But um, I, I don't know when it would apply within these bylaws, because I think we've used that either 60% or majority of currently serving board members in all cases. Uh, but, you know, more or less the Open Meetings Act says something else. So I, I think we've sort of addressed it. But, uh, you know, that's that's meant to be the that's meant to be just kind of the fallback. One of the reasons, or not one of, the main reason we put that the default language is because in the current bylaws, uh, there were a number of places talking about the board can do certain things, but without specifying the, the vote. Uh, and because in other places there was, a, it was specified. So we wanted default language so that, uh, you know, if without having to change every time there's something in the bylaws saying that the board may do something, uh, you know, if, if it wasn't specified how, then it was the default. So, um, and I think from a uh, from our perspective, most of these were quote unquote business decisions, how you wanted to operate. The only thing that was controlling was whether there was anything in the uh, statute, uh, Act 55 or the Open Meetings Act that required a certain, you know, percentage of vote. Uh, we, we made sure that, that those controlled. And then everything else uh, was up to uh, the discretion of the, uh, you know, uh, is up to the discretion of the board, how it wants to do that. And, you know, we came up with those three different options. Well, this meeting is a very good example. I mean, right now we're down three board members, right? So we only have seven. Uh, people present and, you know, to amend the bylaws, we need a heightened threshold of it. So, uh, you know, we need as many people on board as we can get at this point, right? Or else we'll have to postpone it. Uh, any other dialogue on this? I would like to, if we want to make some motions or amendments or propose something, I'd like to get those on the table, but I want to make sure everybody has a chance to weigh in dialogue wise as well. Uh, 
Okay, so procedurally, I think what we need to do is, is vote uh, on the bylaws first. Uh, and only if we pass those can we then pass, does it make sense to pass the secretary and the treasurer resolutions too? Uh, so I wanna bring, I guess, the bylaws to a vote uh, and open it up and see if there's, but if, you know, if there's any proposed, you know, Raymond, if you wanna make a uh, proposed change to it uh, at this point, I can make a motion, we can see if it's seconded and then you can make a proposed change to it. So uh, can I get somebody to move the bylaws to a vote into the record? Can I have a I make a motion for that? Kyra? Motion. Seconded by Ryan. All right, further discussion, any proposed changes to the bylaws? Then? Raymond? So, so we're actually voting on the bylaws right now? Because it's not listed in the packet as a decision item. Yeah, that was a mistake. I mean, we can postpone it, but it should have been a D instead of an O. So if, if people don't feel comfortable voting on it tonight, we can postpone it. But the intent was to vote on it tonight. That's why it's on the regular agenda instead of closed session. Well, then I, I would make a motion if we are voting on those tonight, then um, I... you. you you heard me make my proposal earlier today, what my proposed um, edits are. Those, I would like to make a motion to make those um, changes. Okay, so you're, just so I'm clear, you wanna make two proposed changes. One, well, let me hear you say them so we, we're clear about it. Okay, let me scroll back to the... Uh, I think we'll, we'll vote on them. We'll have to uh, consider them one at a time. Okay. The first one is the 60% for, for recommending re removal. Yes, so under section three, um, the second sentence reads, if a board member engages in conduct that is against the AAATA's best interests, the board may, by majority vote of currently serving board members, recommend removing that member to the jurisdiction that appointed the member. So I would suggest changing the word majority vote to 60% to be consistent with the other sections, like in section six. So it would read, if a board member engages in conduct that is against the AAATA's best interest, the board may by 60% vote of currently serving board members recommend removing that member to the jurisdiction that appointed the member. Okay. That's my motion. All right. Do I have a second for that? I'll second. Second. Okay. Uh, so that's a proposal. Let's consider these one at a time so we can we can vote on that. So the proposal is to change currently serving board members to 60% uh, of currently serving board members. Is that correct, Raymond? Correct. Okay. So that's, there's a motion, it's been seconded. We'll take a vote on that then. Uh, we'll go through uh, one at a time. Raymond? Yes. Brian? Yes. Jesse? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Susan? Yes. Kyra? Yes. And I'm also a yes. So we'll change that to say, by instead of by majority vote of currently serving board members, we'll say by a vote of 60% of currently serving board members. And then second motion, go ahead. Raymond, you're on mute. Thank you for that. Yes, and then my second motion is under section 11, policy governance, the second sentence reads, uh, this model shall govern the board as long as it is not in conflict with these bylaws, the articles of incorporation or laws of the state of Michigan. Um, I would amend that, I propose to amend that second sentence to read, this model may govern the board as long as it is not in conflict with these bylaws, the articles of the state of Michigan. Okay, and, and just, 
for the record, we're talking about Article 3, Section 11. Uh, the last one was yes. Article, Article 3, Section 11. Uh, so that's been proposed as a motion. Do I have a second? Welcome, Mike. Thank you. I was trying to get in for the last five minutes, but I couldn't. Sorry. And welcome, Roger. Sorry, I'm late. It's all right. Just to recap, we are uh, uh, in the middle of a vote. So there's been a motion uh, by Raymond on the floor to uh, change a part of the bylaws, which is Article 3, Section 11, the part that reads, uh, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, um, changing shall to, I'm sorry, changing shall to may um, for policy governance. Uh, so Raymond has brought a motion to the floor. Do we have a second for that? Not seeing a mo not seeing a second, then that motion would fail. Are there any proposed motions to the bylaws? Then, uh, just to recap, Roger and Mike, the just before you got on, the board did carry Raymond's motion to under Article Three, Section Section. Uh, apologize. Uh, it's, I'm sorry. It's Article. To my apologies, um, section four. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, four is, uh, removal. Uh, we changed. We changed the bylaws to say that it was uh, uh, a. Uh, it takes a, now a vote of 60% of currently voting board members to recommend to the jurisdiction the removal of a board member. So the, just before you got on, we adopted that. Um, the last motion did not carry. Any other proposed motions to the bylaws then? Okay. Uh, as amended, as we as the board just amended the bylaws, can I have somebody move the amended bylaws into the record? Kyra, seconded by Roger. Uh, so we'll bring those to a vote. Uh, the bylaws as amended. Uh, just and now, by Eric. Let me just clarify. There's been sure. only the one amendment. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thanks. And procedurally, what we're going to do is vote on the bylaws and then vote on the treasurer, vote on the secretary uh, resolution and vote, then vote on the treasurer resolution. Okay. Uh, then we'll go through the roll call for the vote for the new bylaws as amended. Uh, yes or no, Mike? Yes. Roger? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Jesse? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Susan? Yes. Kyra? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Did I miss anybody by accident? Okay. Uh, so those are carried. The, bylaw, the new bylaws is amended. Next we'll go to the, uh, I think in a packet is the secretary board secretary uh, role. Uh, that resolution is resolution six. Uh, any questions or comments? I'll open it up to the board for questions and comments about the resolution on, this, on the board secretary duties. Not seeing anybody, can I have a resolution to uh, somebody bring that resolution as a motion to adopt from the board? Kathleen, seconded by. 
Roger. Any other further discussion on the secretary resolution? If not, we'll call the roll. Mike? Yes. Roger? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Jesse? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Susan? Yes. Kyra? Yes. And I'm also a yes, so that passes. And then finally, there is the treasurer resolution, uh, which is before you. We had a little bit of dialogue, Mike and Roger, about that uh, uh, earlier today. Uh, any other further discussion or questions about the treasurer role or the treasurer resolution? If not, can I have somebody move that into the record for a vote, that resolution? Mike, seconded by Roger. We'll go through the roll, Mike. Yes. Roger. Yes. Raymond. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Jesse. Yes. Kathleen. Yes. Susan. Yes. Kyra. Yes. And I'm also a yes. So those have passed. Thank you very much. We move on then to the next item in the packet, which is 3.3 capital reserve policy recommendation. Uh, it's on page, the new page 50. Can I have somebody move that into the record? Uh, I'm sorry, can I, let, let me tee it up first with uh, Mike Alamein. Uh, Mike, any uh, conversation or discussion you wanna lead into for the vote? Sure, let me just say briefly, um, if people probably recall that the uh, we talked about a capital reserve policy and it was assigned to the finance committee to propose one. What we have uh, on the agenda and before you is what is being proposed by the finance committee with the great help of Rose Mercier, who made it very simple, much simpler than I thought would be possible. Um, and it basically says it's the board's responsibility to approve uh, the utilization of that fund. And it also, then the other part of that is very simply a, a restriction on the uh, CEO being able to do that, of course, without saying, without the approval of the board. It's, it's very simple. Um, we also talked about some other things that might go into that policy. Um, and we're gonna consider that in the future. I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, we thought maybe, and we're gonna give some more consideration to this, to have uh, the capital reserve put into separate uh, investment accounts so that it, it, it can be really walled off from everything else. And, and also maybe to have a different investment policy for that. Right now it would be covered under the general investment policy, uh, but maybe, let me emphasize maybe, because the capital reserve will be there on a longer term, uh, maybe it would be wise to allow a longer term investment for that, that could earn more money. But again, that's just for the future. But uh, we are very enthusiastic about this very simple policy and again, I'll thank Rose for making it simple for us. Any discussion or questions for Mike or the Finance Committee or Rose about the resolution in the packet or the amended the language itself, which is also in the packet just before the uh, draft resolution? Raymond? Just a, a, maybe it's a Scrivener's error perfunctory in nature, but um, there's a note that says subsequent policies renumbered, um, but this one looks like it should be 2.5.7. I don't think that's that, you know, important, but I, I 
because if I'm reading it correctly, 2.5.6 is above, and then this would be a new 2.5.7. So Good just catch. to draw people's attention to it. Yeah. Good catch. Well, so that'll be 2.5.7. And then we'll also change the, uh, I mean, it's not a trivial matter because we've got to change the, uh, uh, the resolution to reflect that now. So we'll be, um, would you mind a, if I friend in a friendly way, use your suggestion to amend the resolution, Raymond, that'd be all right. So the, we're gonna amend the resolution to on the third line under the, therefore be it resolved, the third line down, starting with activities, it'll say activities by adding policy item 2.5.7, not six. Thank you, Raymond. Any other questions? Roger? Just, just so I'm clear on this coming in at the end. Um, so the CEO is not allowed to use those funds. Um, the board must approve of those funds be transferred to another account and then he would use them out of that account. Is that, that my understanding? No, no, Roger, I I mentioned a separate account as maybe something we would add in the future. Yeah. It just, uh, it will just be reflected differently on the financial statements, but it won't actually physically go into another account or financially go into another account. But he, but he can't spend the amount of money that was set aside in the capital reserve. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Jesse, you have a hand up. Um, I just wanted to thank the uh, finance committee for, for this. I'm sure the simple language belies the amount of thought that went into it. Um, so th this is just some of the best policy I think we've, um, or at least some of the most elegantly written policy that we've uh, addressed. So um, I just want to thank you for your work on this and thank you, Rose, for, for all of your work. Um, I wish you could all be this simply put. There's too many lawyers on the call for that. <laughs> All right, any other dialogue, questions? All right, can I have somebody move it into the record um, as amended? Mike, seconded by. Jesse? Uh, we'll call the roll then, uh, yes or no, up or down on the resolution for the Capital Reserve, Mike? Yes. Roger? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Jesse? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tyra? Yes. I'm also yes. So that passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, then we'll move to section four, the strategy and operational updates from the CEO. Uh, I think the first one uh, we'll start off with is the final August service plan. It looks like Forrest uh, is going to take us through that if he's still on. Eric, may I interject for a second? Um, oh. mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, don't think, I don't think that's part of Robert's rules of order. But go ahead. Uh, two things. One, um, I, I think uh, the reason for me to attend the this meeting is over. If that's correct, then I, I will leave the meeting. Uh, uh, I just wanted to interject. I think uh, I'm gonna plan on talking to uh, Rose uh, to determine whether there is something we can include in the policy manual that addresses of uh, the issue raised by Raymond of an inadvertent uh, failure to follow. Uh, and I think it may be able to resolve that or deal with it uh, in that in the manual uh, rather than uh, now that the language is you know shall follow it so uh, you know the intent of that manual is internal not to uh, provide a basis for claims uh, by third parties against the organization so uh, that may be a way of of addressing that issue as well so Rose and I can talk about that and if we feel there's a uh, something that we, you know, bring back to you, we'll do that. Sure. And I, I think also my 
intention of being here was has been served. So if you don't mind, I'm trying to leave on a short holiday. So if I can get away now, I'd be happy. Thank you for attending, both okay. of you. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, uh, and moving on to the uh, uh, August service plan, I think we are back to Forrest. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just, uh, uh, you know, first I want to apologize for repeating materials. Uh, I know we have been including that attachment for a few times. Uh, and this is kind of a procedure thing and probably will benefit our newest uh, board member. Uh, welcome, Susan. Um, so there is, this update is more on the public feedback. So we, uh, we had a one month period for public uh, to provide our feedback. Um, and then, you know, as you can tell from the attached report, uh, we had a six public town halls. We have a, a online um, and then uh, via the phone or email uh, or regular mail to receive uh, public uh, feedback. Uh, in total, we only got less than 100 feedback this time, this around, uh, from probably roughly 60 people. Um, I consider maybe, you know, people by now, they know, they heard, uh, they, they still have some concerns, but we'll, like I uh, mentioned before, uh, this is, uh, you know, the August service plan implemented on August 29th, uh, but going forward, we're going to closely monitor the service. Uh, as students coming back, commuters coming back, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more, uh, and then we can tweak things as we go. So that will go go to next uh, planning cycle. The earliest will be January 2022. Um, but this is kind of a procedure thing. Uh, even though you see the uh, equity analysis uh, attached to it, it's more for FTA requirement. So we we need to include in the uh, board package just to demonstrate we go through this process. Um, so I, I will probably pass on to Brian for a little bit update on the operational readiness for the Ox service plan. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, uh, you know, Brian and I are here to, to answer. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Brian. For operational readiness, if I'll put on my uh, deputy CEO's hat for a moment. Uh, we are still hiring operators and technicians uh, and looking for uh, a few good people. Uh, so if anybody knows anyone, uh, the important part of that, however, is that we are struggling like uh, really the rest of the world in finding employees. And while we are making contingency plans to make sure that we can still roll out full service uh, on August 29th, uh, we, one element of those plans uh, I, I do feel obligated to say um, is having service uh, not run, you know, some portions of the service, uh, working with planning uh, and innovation on which those might be. Uh, the goal, if we had to do that, would be to uh, reduce frequency on existing routes as opposed to eliminating anything. Um, I, and I do want to stress that that's a dire situation uh, and, and we do not believe we're going to be there um, but want to to be transparent about it that we're we continue to struggle uh, we are down uh, 15 operators right now we are uh, training our second class this year and working on building a third class and plan on a fourth so uh, we, we are working as diligently as we can to resolve the issue but uh, would be remiss if I didn't, didn't bring it up that, that it is uh, an issue that, that we are not immune from, uh, even though we do, uh, for anybody listening uh, from the public, do start training at $19 an hour. So please uh, give us a ring if anybody knows anyone. Thank you. Kathleen, do you have a hand up? I do. Then my question is for Forrest Yang. Forrest, I would, excellent report, by the way. I do have one question, and my question is, on um, A-Ride, your uh, passenger service uh, fee is $3, and the PCA is free. 
but when you talk about flex ride, night ride, uh, holiday ride, um, you do mention the A ride card being 250, which is lovely, which I think is half the rate of a regular person, but you don't mention the PCA at all. And so I'm wondering, is the PCA then still free or are you going to charge for PCA? And I do believe that that might be information that might be important to the public. Uh, that, that's a good question. I, to be honest, uh, <laughs> I don't want to put Adina on uh, on the spot. Um, maybe Brian, I don't know the answer. Um, I don't know if Brian or Adina knows the answer. Just uh, real quickly, you're talking about the late night and holiday ride flex ride or the standard? No, I'm talking about the late night holiday ride. You do mention the A ride card required 250 fee, but there's no mention of PCA. And somebody who uses night ride, holiday ride may very well have a PCA. And so um, because on, on the regular A ride, you mentioned that a PCA is free, but there's no mention at all on here about a PCA. So I'm thinking that it might be important to say a PCA is allowed and are you going to charge a fee or are they going to be free? So that, that is an excellent question. And uh, for those particular two services as they're premium services and not uh, required under ADA, uh, we do have the option of charging. So I'll have to, to research and see what we have done uh, historically. Uh, I believe the intention was to bring it back uh, at a similar level uh, without any fare changes. There was no intention of changing those fares. So I'll need to just make sure we're consistent with what we've done historically. Uh, otherwise we would have brought this as a, as a fair change to the board. Thank you. Others? Susan, go ahead. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm late to the game for uh, the, the service plan, given that we're soon to be in August, but it's described as a recovery uh, proposal. Uh, we're restoring service and until the pandemic, Route 4 went through downtown 50% of the time first and then the hospitals and 50% of the time hospitals and then downtown. And it was by far the single largest route into downtown in terms of ridership and the most important in terms of the downtown employee base. And uh, I was concerned when I heard that at the pandemic, that routing into downtown would be stopped and it would only run to the hospital first, leaving, as I understood it, only Packard as serving the Ypsilanti market to, to help serve uh, employees getting into downtown. So a question for me about the restoration of service, why the 50% of the routing isn't going back into downtown? And two, if that's impossible for reasons that you know, I'd, I'd like to hear, what we're doing to get employees from the east to downtown. Uh, I, uh, the concern I have is that this is a university hospital-centric uh, design for Route 4, um, and it doesn't really speak to the community and downtown Ann Arbor. And so again, it's a restoration uh, previous to COVID. And I'm curious to see what we're doing for all those riders we were bringing in from Ypsilanti to work in the downtown. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, good question. Actually, this has been raised uh, before. Uh, I think we heard some concerns from board members, from some public as well. Um, the um, the point that we try to, uh, there are certainly different options uh, in order to provide service to other to downtown commuters and the hospital. I think the biggest challenge we had before is the service reliability uh, along uh, Washington Avenue. Uh, so the way we try to manage it, because it will, if we run one branch, we can have very frequent service. Like in this case, we have every eight minute service. So people don't have to look at the schedule. They just jump on a bus, uh, um, you know, they can get on the bus stop at any time. So, and then also benefit for ongoing operational management 
because if a bus is uh, you know delayed or we can insert a bus, so we don't have to look at the schedule. We just uh, simply insert a bus to bring back uh, to the schedule. So there, there are also, you know, I can um, tell there are pros and cons. Of course, that will add probably three, five minutes, depends on the time of the day, uh, on the downtown commuter's travel time. There's no question about it. And our, I don't know if, uh, if you all, all remember, we did a BRT study along Washington Avenue, the preferred uh, option, I mean, the route alignment is to go through a hospital and then downtown. So there, there are some, like I said, there are some justification, there are pros and cons. And as a result of all balancing all the things, so we, you know, we decide to have uh, one branch uh, only for route four. But I did hear, you know, we did hear from, like I said, from some board members, from, uh, from some writers as well. Um, like I mentioned before, we're gonna closely monitor it. I'm sure when students coming back and downtown commuters coming back or our university employees coming back, we're gonna hear more uh, on this particular issue. Uh, we are, you know, we're prepared to uh, incorporate whatever we are gonna hear into our January service plan. Uh, so this is a good, this is a, I would say, I wouldn't say it's a it's a pilot. I would say it's kind of a combination of all the balancing uh, of different needs, um, and then I guess we're we're gonna watch it closely and tweak it as we go. So then, let me sort of give you some feedback. I think it's invalid to describe this as restoring service levels because we are effectively taking away 50% of the rides we saw on the go pass came on route four. By removing the service, the plan is not restoring that service. And so I think the language is incorrect. I think we are bringing back some service, but that's probably the key service for downtown. And two, I'm not hearing anything about how we're going to bring people from Ypsilanti to downtown. Uh, I understand about the BRT and that's into the future and the routing, but for the moment, we're looking at service for uh, people that are working in our downtown, living in Ypsilanti, and it's been a life's blood. So it, it seems a shame that for our future, for the near term years, we're looking at years, we're not going to be serving downtown. Um, it, it seems like it's kind of a a big hit to the Get Downtown program. You didn't speak to Get Downtown and how that needs this. Again, about 50% of the rides on the Go Pass was on Route 4. And by removing the service, you've eliminated about 50% of the use of that pass. And given the city's sustainability goals, to have all of those employees now commuting in by car seems, um, for a future BRT many years from now, it seems like we're working counter to the goals that we've, we've since, since COVID have announced. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very disappointed to put it mildly. And I'm, um, I'm concerned again that the language misrepresents to the community that we're actually restoring service since we've eliminated the primary artery into downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Brian or Forrest, if you wanted to respond to that or you could look uh, into it further. Sure, you know, I, I just want to point that out to, you know, I understand the frustration um, um, from the downtown commuter perspective, but it's not that we discontinue the service to downtown, it's, uh, you know, adding probably three, five minutes travel time for downtown commuters. Uh, but now they have, um, I would say for half of the service on Route 4. We used to run every 15 minutes uh, from Ypsilanti, Weill, CCTC to downtown. Uh, and then every 15 minutes service from Ypsilanti, Weill Hospital to downtown. Right now, all branches being consolidated to, you know, Weill Hospital. Yes, the travel time is a little bit longer, but there's still very frequent service. Like every eight minutes uh, and 15 minutes, 
there's going to be connection, direct connection from YTC to BTC. So it's taking a little bit longer, but I think the frequency is still there, the connection is still there. But, you know, again, not, not to belabor it, and I'll, I'll stop, but we're, we're basically taking what were a number of people that were riders of choice and riders who were using downtown for their employment and adding 35 minutes, 40 minutes to the commute, which is not inconsiderable. And now it's really the only way uh, they can get there is we've added 30 minutes at either end of their commute uh, to, to the other part of the commute. Uh, that's just an addition to what they were doing already. So it, it is not an insignificant um, inconvenience and likely is going to be a huge drawback to people who were getting very comfortable commuting by transit to work and now will likely be finding their way to a car if in fact we can have them working downtown. And as we're saying with operators, it's very hard for people to find employees. Uh, having uh, removed this very attractive transportation option, we're both gonna uh, reduce the benefit to the, to the go pass but we're going to make it harder for downtown employers to find employees. And we're absolutely going counter to the city goal of getting more people out of their car and onto the bus. And so I strongly urge us between now and the next service plan change in January to find significant improvement on the Ipsy to Ann Arbor routing. I don't think it's sufficient to say that in the future there'll be a BRT. And so we can't do anything. I think we have to find a way to get Ipsy employees uh, Ann Arbor employees who, who happen to live in Ipsy, uh, I think we have to find solutions to get them to work out of their car. And, and again, I'm sorry to, to, to belabor it and I'll, I'll leave it there. No, that's fine. Um, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Well, only to wrap up the issue so we can, can keep it moving. I think, um, Roger, if you don't mind, I would, I would like to put uh, this on the service committee's plate to look into a little further uh, and work with Forrest to uh, dive into this issue if you don't have a problem with that. But um, if, if Forrest and Roger are okay with that, I think this is a service committee issue that we should look into. Yeah, um, yes, let's put it on the agenda for our next committee meeting. Great. Other discussion items about uh, the uh, August service plan? Okay, I'm sorry, did I see anybody? No. Uh, let's move on then to the gold ride uh, issue. Uh, and I think uh, Brian is going to walk us through that. That's gold ride approvals. There's a contract authorization approval and also a fair rate discussion. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So page 77 of the packet has the start of the issue brief. And if you'll uh, allow me just to walk through a bit of a timeline for the Gold Ride premium on-demand service. Uh, back in February, staff had proposed ceasing the Gold Ride premium on-demand service with the rationale being that the 2018 paratransit study had discussed that the blending of our ADA service, our A-Ride service with the Gold Ride service made cost control very difficult because we had a premium service with a mandated service and, and it was difficult to separate the two. Uh, and so in February, uh, as we still had a structural deficit uh, going forward, um, as it was run in 2019, the Gold Ride service did not cover uh, the entirety of the authority's members and oftentimes for same day service was not accessible. Uh, <clears throat> staff had proposed to cease that gold ride service. And in March, uh, during the public meetings, the initial public meetings that we had, uh, there was great concern. Uh, it was the single uh, largest topic item uh, mentioned during the public meetings uh, and at the board that there was a concern of ending this longstanding community service and the board directed staff to investigate uh, <clears throat> a way to restore service so that it was a service restoration um, that addressed the equity concerns uh, both uh, in the service area and in the same day 
service for people who use mobility devices uh, and bring it back in the same time frame as the rest of the service restoration. So in April and May, the staff ID'd uh, a current provider that we have under contract uh, that is uh, ready, willing, and able to start service this uh, at the end of this August uh, and had the board support to take that to the public. So in June uh, at the public board or at the public meetings uh, that Forrest just referred to, uh, we did take back a plan to bring back the gold ride service with an expanded service area so that anywhere within an authority member uh, and within three quarters of a mile of a fixed route, we would continue, to, we would now offer the gold ride service. Uh, <clears throat> Part of the 2018 paratransit study suggested that premium services be priced accordingly. And so the affair has been proposed of $5 for uh, verified low income seniors and $20 for all other seniors uh, with an estimated cost of $750,000. Uh, one of the, the difficulties in this and, and something that is a our best estimate uh, is what the demand is going to be because you want to be able to match the demand that's on the street with uh, the number of vehicles that you put on the road and still have cost control uh, with an expanded service area uh, an increased cost uh, and a post pandemic world, uh, hard to figure exactly what both the demand and then the resulting cost would be but the best estimate that we can come, come to is about $750,000 as a not to exceed. Uh, one advantage to having this as a premium on demand service is that uh, we can have that not to exceed amount uh, and that while demand may exceed supply, uh, we can track those denials as they come. Uh, and I would point to the night ride service that we have on the street right now there is more demand at the beginning of the night and at the beginning of the day. Uh, so, you know, right when it starts around midnight and right when it's ending in the 5 a.m. hour, then there is service available. Um, so we have a, an increased level of denial at that time, but the cost for the night ride service doesn't exceed or doesn't grow uh, uncontrollably uh, the way our paratransit and on-demand services had grown in the past. So uh, denials in this case for premium service are not a civil rights issue um, like they would be with ADA service. Uh, I will say this service as proposed for August is generally a, a higher cost per hour. It varies depending on what the demand is going to be, uh, but that is a function of being able to get it up and running by August. Uh, so the, the price we're paying for that convenience uh, is a higher price. However, uh, the, the goal is that we are able to provide an equ equitable service at a fixed expense while we spend uh, the next year searching uh, for a more sustainable solution for this. And so the, the vote this evening uh, gives us that time to research and, and identify those more sustainable ways and at the same time, restoring a service uh, that is highly valued by the community and by the board. Uh, and both of these items are brought for the board's approval uh, due to the, the policy governance guidelines. The CEO shall not authorize contracts in excess of $250,000. So with this change order being 750 and it, it straddles two budget years, but it starts in this budget year. So it's not something that can just be put on to uh, next year's budget and approved at that time uh, in order to be started by August 29th. And then the fares of $5 and $20 have been analyzed uh, in, for Title VI equity and determined to be equitable. Uh, the fair equity analysis is attached and, and is in the board packet. Um, and one note that I'll, I'll end on is that with the fares set where they are, that came into 
consideration for estimating the demand. And if we were to set the fares higher, the demand would be lower. If we were to set the fares lower, the demand would be higher. And at some point, if you have too much demand with not enough service on the road, the impression you give the public is that you know you, you really don't have anything available. Um, even if you do have two or three or four vehicles, if the demand is for eight vehicles and you can only service half of the requests, um, that that's a, a problem. So part of the reason to set the fares uh, where they are. So with, with that, Mr. Chair, I would, would be happy to answer any questions that folks have and uh, go for it. Okay. Thank you, Brian. So we do have a resolution, <coughs> excuse me, in our packet, uh, kind of authorizing the contract and setting the rates themselves uh, with a 750,000 cap. Uh, questions, comments uh, on this uh, issue from board members? Jesse, I think I see your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Brian, I know I've asked you this question before, but I feel like I, I need to ask one more time. Um, so with, uh, you know, I think back to the, um, you know, the line graphs that we got used to seeing over the past three years of the, uh, you know, our revenues compared with the cost of paratransit. Um, in the short term, what we're doing by adopting this resolution is making the curve of the cost of paratransit steeper. Like we, as, as I seem to recall you saying that what we are doing is we are increasing the costs of the, the overall cost of paratransit uh, by this, this, uh, this plan, at least in the short term. In the short term, it does increase, uh, not the cost of, of paratransit, I would say, but purchase transportation. Purchase transportation. Uh, and and on-demand services, yes, sir, uh, it, it does. Okay, um, and what's your, um, I mean, I've expressed a lot of trepidation about this. It's not anyone who actually cares can look at the um, service committee meeting notes, but um, what, what is your timeline for um, assessment on, on this? Um, you know, you're, you're saying that you're hoping that we can find some more, uh, you know, a better contract. Um, but like, how often will this, will this be reassessed? So the goal for this contract extension is to give us a year's time to do that research uh, and, and look at what demand we see uh, and also see how pricing uh, sorts itself out uh, without getting too far into the weeds. Uh, one of the, the ways to do this is to subsidize uh, local providers uh, and, and use local providers that are, are here and available. Um, and, and I very cautiously say like Uber and Lyft, but it doesn't have to be Uber and Lyft. It can be you know, Mode, which is the public service that Golden Limousine runs um, or any of the other private providers. Um, however, they're under the same crunch we are right now. Uh, for operators and for you know, to, to get uh, fares. And so fares on all of those services have either increased or the service has, has stopped. So uh, that's part of what we have to see what unfolds in a post-pandemic, hopefully soon post-pandemic world. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments and questions? Susan? So uh, it, just it's a question about how to set the fare. Did, did we look at what the taxis were charging, what Uber and Lyft are charging? Because our customers are likely going to be looking at this. Again, this is not paratransit. This is equivalent to a taxi service. I just uh, just looked lift from my house, and I'm I'm near York. Uh, to get to the hospitals is twenty three dollars. So twenty dollars seems very reasonable, given that the customer would be evaluating this versus twenty three for Lyft. So I was just curious if we 
uh, took a stab at trying to understand what our customers are saying as far as their costs. Uh, I had dinner with a 90 year old friend on Friday and he told me he's taking taxis everywhere and minimally he's spending $15 just to get the taxi. So I was intrigued by his statement that he would be the, uh, the user of this and he's just looking to see how to get around and he's probably doing cost comparing. So I'm curious if we did cost comparing with the private sector. We did. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly enough, in the time frame uh, that I outlined from February through to, to now, uh, those costs have changed. Um, initially, when uh, we were bringing this forward to the committee level and, and researching it at, set, at the staff level, uh, we were we were thinking that a $15 fare would, would be sufficient to be non-competitive with the private sector. Um, and about two months into the work, it, it became very apparent that that wasn't the case anymore and that it was, was closer to the, the $20. Um, so we did increase that to $20. And initially the fare for uh, verified low income seniors was set at $10, uh, but that, met with resistance in terms of being too high for someone who, who is on a fixed income and, and essentially making it inaccessible for them. So uh, that was where the $5 fare came from as a proposal is still being higher than our A-ride fare, uh, but uh, lower than the $10 originally proposed. And uh, it, it has been a challenge to try to stay abreast of the changes in, in fares, particularly when you know some of the services are able to change fares really by the minute. Um, so it they were taken into consideration and, and increased because of that. Um, but it I, I'm not shocked to, to hear frankly that that it still doesn't necessarily exceed what the, the private industry might be charging. Uh, Raymond, then Kathleen. So <clears throat> I'll preface my statement with kind of my viewpoint on this issue. And that is, you know, as a board member, what I really hope we want to strive for is to provide the best damn transit service we can provide of fixed route and paratransit. Um, I'm of the impression that if we provide great service um, that is universal and accessible to everyone, then it becomes attractive to everyone. So whether that means increased frequencies, increased reliability, increased coverage, what have you. So when I see proposals that possibly take away from our ability to augment and improve our fixed route system, which you know, one of our board members expressed concern over, you know, a key route that serves downtown, um, and we're providing a non-required service um, at a price tag that could go towards providing other service. Then it causes me some hesitation and pause. So I have two concerns really with where we are. The first is, and and uh, Jesse touched on it. You know, we have in the two plus years that I've been on this board, we've, we've been told consistently that we are headed towards a structural deficit where our revenues um, will not keep up with our costs. Um, and so all the decisions that I make that have a financial impact, that is always in the back of my mind. Um, this will add to that. You know, having the service will add to and complicate and further, um, you know, compound that problem. The second issue that I have with the proposal is while I appreciate, you know, staff being responsive to the concerns that have been heard and providing a sort of compromise solution, the compromise solution worries me a little bit in that it, the cap is quite frankly, somewhat arbitrary. Now I know we did our best to estimate and our staff did their best to estimate and I appreciate that. But let's, uh, let's not forget that we've also expanded the coverage area. So, and, and I understand and appreciate why that was proposed as well. So now we have more people that'll be eligible for the service. 
um, but we've capped it. So you're going to hit a situation, presumably, or um, we can expect, whereby we will have to start turning people away. Um, and that doesn't feel like a good solution. It, it turns it into a first come, first served. For those that become reliant on that service, it may be here today and then gone the next day when we hit that cap. And that doesn't feel like a reliable form of transportation. I would rather sink that money into improving our fixed route so that it serves the needs of our community. Um, and so for those two reasons, um, both in terms of just the fiscal impact on our bottom line budget, as well as kind of this compromise solution, in my opinion, hitting a situation whereby we won't be able to serve the needs of the people we're trying to serve. Uh, I, I don't think I can vote for it today. I thought long and hard about it. I know that's probably not a very popular stance. Um, but again, my, my interest is to make sure that we can provide the best fixed route and the best paratransit service we can possibly provide. And in doing so, we can meet the needs kind of like universal design where anybody and everybody hopefully can pick between those two services uh, to get where they need to in our community. Kathleen? Oh, Raymond, <laughs> you and I are going to butt heads here, and Jesse. Um, for me, I understand all of that, and I am extremely concerned about budget and what our future is going to look like. However, when I think about our seniors and what they have experienced in terms of Gold Ride over, I don't know, know how long it's been in operation, it's been five years, 10 years, whatever it's been, um, I understand that we want to make fixed route more attractive or if a senior is disabled, they can now be in paratransit instead of being um, on the gold ride. But I would implore you to think about our millages and how many seniors have voted for our millages. I would implore you to think about, it's one thing to say, oh, everything's near a quarter of a mile from somewhere. What does that look like? Are there sidewalks? Are there pads? Are there dirt roads? Um, everyone, uh, as we're human beings, when we think about life, we always think about it with rose colored glasses. When you think about fixed route, are you thinking about snow? Are you thinking about ice? Are you thinking about rain? Um, that 90 year old person that Susan was talking about, could they walk a quarter of a mile unaided and wait for a bus stop through the pouring rain, through the ice, through the snow to get to a fixed route to go grocery shopping and then carry all of their groceries home. Um, the reason why I was one of the people who was very upset when the original proposal was to not bring Gold Ride back at all uh, was because of those reasons. When I think about the population, our aging population, it, no, it's not a perfect system. Yes, we maybe could have used that money to make other routes more attractive or build them up or whatever. But right now we're in an opportunity, this year gives us an opportunity to look at how can we uh, better maintain and help our seniors get around. I don't, Fixed route isn't always the answer. And you're by saying that, oh, well, they can apply for an A-ride card. We're already saying paratransit is through the roof with cost. I think paratransit is way more expensive than the gold ride that we're proposing. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not, but I also think that we need this time to let staff regroup and to look at what's gonna happen over the next year, to talk to the public. Maybe we can look at further millages. Maybe we can talk to, we can come up with more creative ideas. But I think at this juncture to put Gold Ride dead in the water is one of the biggest mistakes we could ever make morally. Um, financially, maybe we are making a mistake, but morally, I think it's our imperative to think about what we are, we would be taking away from folks. And I, so anyway, I, I'm feeling really passionate about this and I know I'm talking on a, on a lower level than you were. You're talking more at 30,000 feet and I'm talking more at 1,000 feet. But um, 
if you ride the bus, Raymond or Jesse, and you yourself don't have mobility issues and you've had to walk, trudge through the snow and the ice and the rain and the, and the whatever or the dirt roads or whatnot, a quarter of a mile, put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's arthritic. They may not qualify for a paratransit. Uh, they may not qualify for ADA or whatever. I don't know what the qualifications are, but I think we're asking a lot of our seniors to just wipe it off the board at this juncture when they've had it for so long. That's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Others? I would just like to throw in that I concur with Kathleen and I, I would not be supportive of anything that limits access for seniors. Uh, just in my own clear conscience, I cannot do that. So uh, Kathleen, thank you for your comments. They were well received. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Okay. Uh, well, there is a resolution uh, for a vote in the packet uh, for both the contract authorization approval uh, and the fair rate approval. So, uh, I think if there's no other discussion, we can move this into uh, to the floor for a vote. Brian, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just a note that uh, as part of our Title VI plan, uh, if we determine to not bring that gold ride, uh, we would need the board to vote. And Forrest, correct me if I'm getting the, the phrasing of this wrong, um, but to vote that, that there was no other alternative uh, despite the disproportionate impact on uh, vulnerable populations that due to the budget limitations that, that we had to eliminate the service. Um, we could bring that to the board for the next board meeting, um, but would, would need to have that uh, vote on the record. I guess what, one other question, I think in the report you mentioned, um, Brian, I think your report stated that the, the proposed fares, 51.2% uh, increase in total fare revenue for the 90% of riders affected by the fare changes who are incomes below 150% of the poverty line. That's a 38.8% difference. Our policy says disproportionate burden if it's more than 10%. Uh, and I, I wondered if what impact that might have to us. Uh, it's on page seven of your report, the, sec the third paragraph. Um, the for uh, racial minority Hispanic, it was 3.9%, et cetera. But I did have a concern about that. And I, I jumped the gun and I wanted to mention that. So I, what, what impact does that have for us? And, and by passing this, would we already be violating our own our own policy if we did that. So that, that question came up at the finance committee as well. And Forrest, if I could put you on the spot uh, for the, the explanation uh, on that, I believe we, we did bring. Oh, thanks, Brian. Um, to just, I know those numbers are a little confusing, you know, less and more. Uh, but I, I want to just so quickly summarize uh, for the proposed affairs, like at $20 for regular, $5 for uh, low income, that would not have any disparate, disparate impact on minorities. And there's no disproportionate burdens on uh, low income. So if we pass this resolution, we don't violate any our own policy or any FTA uh, policy. So even though the paragraph I just pointed out said it has a 38.8% difference to people who are below the 150% threshold. Yeah, I think that um, because the fare increase, so we increase more on, I would say increase less on low income 
and less on minority compared to increase on uh, others. Okay. Any other questions? Mike? Yeah, I have to say I do not fully understand Brian's last statement about disparate impact and what the board would have to do if we do not approve this. So could, could you expand on that some, uh, Brian? Yes, I can. And Forrest, if I, if I get anything wrong, I I'm, have you as my backstop. Since this was a service that we had been providing, our Title VI policy, uh, not necessarily the, the federal policy, but, but the one that we have assigned to ourselves, uh, says that if we are going to stop any service that serves uh, a low income population or a minority population, that our board must take a vote where they affirmatively acknowledge that there is no other uh, less impactful way to achieve the goal than to end the service. Um, that, again, not a federal requirement, but one from our own Title VI policy. And so we would be back next month uh, with a, a request for, I believe, a resolution stating that um, if the board chose not to uh, pass the, the resolutions that are in the packet for this evening. So does that, I'm sorry, does that mean, Brian, that we, if we, if we vote no on this, we are automatically saying there's no better alternative? I mean, is there no opportunity then for the board to say, take another fresh look at this at some point? It feels like, I, I mean, I don't want to put words in Mike's mouth. My own feeling is that that kind of, uh, I'm not sure we want to cross that line to say, hey, if, if this, then that, when we haven't, you know, I'm not sure that it's been clearly explained to everybody that there are no other alternatives, or at least we haven't seen a range of other alternatives that, that we had, we're, we're choosing from, right? We're just choosing from one alternative and it sounds like it's an all or nothing approach. And so Mike, I, I don't want to cut you off, but go ahead. That's, that's exactly what worried me, yes. I, I mean, we really haven't discussed alternatives. So by, set, by turning this down, we've, said there aren't any i mean we really we don't know that i don't know that it, that bothers us so as as part of the the process during the time frame that that i discussed uh between february and now uh that was when we had spent the time trying to figure out what we could bring forward by august of this year uh, and the uh, using an existing contractor with an already set price uh, was the only viable option that staff was able to identify. Um, I, I believe that there are other potentially more sustainable ways to run a, a on-demand, premium on-demand service. Um, none of those ways could we come up with and, and get in place by August, uh, because one of the concerns expressed by the board was uh, something actually our NOSE board member brought up just tonight about uh, calling it a service restoration if we weren't bringing back that service um, and that we needed to bring it back in that same time frame uh, in order to, to be uh, bringing back, a, to say we're bringing back our service. So, well, uh, could Brian could I mean, are we just to stop, just to hit pause right there on that last point? I mean, if we are, um, if we if we are taking out your word that there's no other viable alternatives, um, and we are attesting that there's no viable, well. Going back to your original point or an earlier point you made, this isn't a federal law thing. This is just an internal Title VI own policy thing. So 
who do we need to attest to besides ourselves that you know we we couldn't come up with any other alternative so in, in other words if you come back next month um, with a resolution saying there were no other viable alternatives who does who does that resolution go on the record with other than ourselves i mean if this is not a federal law issue type it, of we would put it in in our essentially in the title six file uh, so that we showed compliance with our own internal policies. The, one of the elements of federal regulations are that, that you're given a floor that you have to meet, but you can set your own bar higher than that. Uh, having set your own bar though, the federal government does require you to meet your own bar. Um, so since we have this as our, our Title VI policy, uh, it would be reviewed by the by the federal government, by the FTA during a triennial review to say you had a service change, uh, you did or did not bring back service, and did you have your board uh, follow the procedure that, that you've outlined in your own Title VI plan. Uh, so it, it's a, It is a self-imposed regulation, but it will be checked by the FTA that we followed our self-imposed regulation. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, other questions, dialogue? Sorry, I was, I was chewing on that. Uh, Susan, go ahead. Yeah, just to clarify, so it was self-imposed the deadline for August, or we have to do this for other reasons? Could, we, could this wait one more month? So the, the deadline of, of bringing everything back in August uh, was self-imposed. Uh, the Title VI plan uh, was not regardless, it didn't have that time frame in it. It's it simply, if you're if you're proposing a service change, you need to be able to show that that has a disproportionate impact. Um, that service change needs to to be acknowledged at the time. This is a, a very odd situation because normally you would not have, you know, this service doesn't exist on the street right now. And that would not normally have happened. We would be continuing to operate service. And if we were proposing to end something, we would put out a proposal that we're going to end it and, and have all of this done while the service continued. We are in the, the unique situation of having temporarily suspended the service due to the pandemic and now are under an obligation to, uh, if we're going to, Keep, keep it suspended, treat it as a, as a reduction in service and, and go through that process. Um, we, the, the FTA gave us a, a grace period due to the pandemic, but that is, that is ended. So we do need to follow this process um, one way or the other. Um, could it wait another month? Uh, we, could, we could postpone a, a vote on this another month, I don't know at that point uh, that we would be able to bring it up to full service August 29th due to the, the contractor needing time to get get started, uh, you know, to the, the startup costs associated with it. Um, so that that's how the timing of this has has come out. Uh, okay. Any other questions, follow up? Okay. Uh, all right, not seeing anything then. Um, we do have the resolution, it's resolution nine in our packet. And uh, it's on the floor for a vote. I would like to bring it to the floor for a vote. I have somebody move it into the record. Kathleen, second it by. Kyra. 
Okay. Uh, we'll just go down the roll call, yes or no on the resolution for the authorization of the contract and the fair authorization. Uh, Mike? Let me first say, this is the by far the toughest vote that I have faced since I've been on the board. And I won't go, I won't bore you with all of the things that are going around in my mind, other than to say, I feel that we're kind of backed into a corner. And I think I feel I have to vote yes. Roger. Yes. Uh, Raymond. No. Brian. No. You're no on the resolution. Sorry. Yes. I'm going to, I, you know, just <laughs> what, just what Mike said, I just kind of have thoughts and I'm a little bit conflicted. Um, I would be in favor really of circling back to this vote, but since we're voting it, yeah, I am gonna go no, vote, I'm voting no. Yeah. Jesse? Uh, with anticipation that we will be addressing this as part of the budget as that we'll need to be signing another contract for this, uh, I will vote yes. Kathleen? Yes. Susan? No. Kyra? Yes. And I'm also a yes. All right, so that motion passes. And we'll move on then to 4.2, the business plan. Uh, and Rosa Maria, is, if she is on. I believe she is uh, owned in for this. See somebody on a phone call with no video. I think that's her. And Keith, are we able to unmute or are we already unmuted on, on our end or Rosa? <laughs> Here she is. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I will briefly uh, introduce the business plan tonight. I in your packet and then I will have Mr. Carpenter answer any questions that there may be in the next board meeting when he returns. So the corporate business plan is a document that develops and prioritizes agency initiatives based on community needs before they're incorporated in the budget for review and adoption. Um, the focus for fiscal year 2022 is supporting the community recover from the pandemic. We are keen to understand and adopt to the evolving society needs and forge forward into the new normal. That said, increasing service levels, um, safety of staff and the traveling public, propulsion studies, YTC and BTC expansion projects are some of the initiatives identified in the business plan. Um, details of these and other initiatives will, are available on page 11 and 12 of the business plan. As we introduce a draft business plan tonight, we seek feedback from the board and the public in order to improve it and to ensure that it reflects the interests of the community. So as I had said before, um, specific questions on the business plan can be directed to um, the CEO's email and that's M-C-A-R-P-E-N-T-E-R. Um, at the right.org. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any questions uh, on the business plan? All right. Uh, seeing none, we'll move to 4.3, the budget process update. Uh, this will be a verbal one from, I think from Dina. Turn it over. Hey, thank you. Um, just wanted to give you a quick update on the budget process. I know that you're all excited about uh, getting involved with that and I'm excited to present it to you. I'm gonna share my screen just for a second so you can see the timeline. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, 
So um, we've been diligently working on the budget. Um, they started uh, even before I arrived. So I'm, I'm getting up to speed on it uh, with the team. But for your purposes, I just wanted to share a brief outline, um, giving you kind of the flow of how we expect things to go over the next uh, couple of months until we get to approval. So um, the budget uh, next week, we're gonna start discussions, pre some preliminary discussions uh, with the board chair. And then we're gonna move into, by the end of next week, July 29th, our first budget preview with the governance committee. Following that, the service committee and the finance committee on their already scheduled dates. Uh, we will incorporate feedback from the board and give you a, a, an overview of all the revenues and expenses, detailed items, um, and the key messages of how we built the budget and what our budget focus is, uh, as well as sharing projections with you about where we expect to be, how we expect to use federal funding, and uh, the capital reserve amount. We're also going to address uh, a discussion regarding the fair uh, change and how that impacts the budget. So you will see that in the committee meeting starting next week. Following that, we will present the draft budget to the board at, on August 19th to the full board. Um, it will look, most likely it will look very much like what you saw uh, in the committee meetings, but we will have the benefit of having the whole board together um, to make, to comment. And we will also have a public hearing. Following that, we will make any adjustments uh, as required or suggested um, as determined by uh, feedback from the board, as well as any other uh, refining of assumptions and estimates as we are further along in the budget process. And then we will present a recommended budget for approval in September, on September 23rd, um, as we do have to have an approved budget to start uh, the next fiscal year on October 1st. Does anybody have any question about the timeline? Mike, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dina. And uh, um, it's got to be a little scary to be here such a short time and having to dive right into the budget. But we have confidence in you, of course. Um, thank you. I think you. I think you answered my question as you went forward when you said the preliminary budget presented to the board will be similar to what we saw in the budget preview. Uh, my question is really, what kind of things are we going to see in the budget preview? Is it pretty much the same detail that we will see in the final budget, but it will be in a, a more preliminary phase? Is, is that correct? I ex uh, so the budget preview will probably provide more detail um, into assumptions and I mean, there will be a high level message, of course, and how we built the budget and, and to give you a sense of making sure we're following all of our guidelines and policies and so on and so forth. And to demonstrate that we're in alignment with our, um, with our plan as uh, was laid out to you in this board packet, um, our business plan. Um, and then we will talk about specific assumptions, impacts of those. Um, and so we will get into probably a higher level of detail in committee meetings. Um, and then in the, in the presenting the draft budget to the board and the public hearing on August 19th would probably be a little bit higher level, um, but make sure to address key issues, of course, and budget variances and things like that so that everyone is um, informed fully about what we're seeing. Um, I would also uh, give you a, a, a little bit of a heads up that we're, we're expecting to, to compare the FY22 budget to the FY20 budget that was approved because the FY21 budget is uh, you know, during the pandemic. And since we're going back to full uh, service levels, we needed to compare it to something that would make sense. Um, it would be hard comparing 21 to 22 in the sense that everything will go up, but that's a factor mostly of the restoration of service. So to give you a kind of a better comparison to costs, we chose uh, to, to select FY20, which was the last budget, pre-pandemic budget. Um, and we'll, we'll walk you through that as well. And we will have, we will have the 21 budget 
kind of off to the side just for ref for reference or or whatever, but it's not as good a comparison. So okay, thanks. So these preliminary meetings, you will talk a lot about assumptions that go mm -hmm. into the budget. And mm -hmm. you will also then show at least to some detail the numbers that flow out of those assumptions. Is oh absolutely. You'll yep, you'll see a full budget. Um, you'll see revenues and expenses, full mm -hmm. budget, and what we'll we'll have the capital budget as well, and projections for you know the next several years, that sort of thing. Okay, great. You you haven't had uh, a lot of <laughs> experience dealing with me, but uh, one of my big points in budgeting is to really talk a lot about the assumptions. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of a heads up on that. But it that sounds good, Dina. Thank you. Much appreciated. Yes. Anybody else? Others? Uh, I, and I, you know, I don't, Dina, we've we we have talked, and I think it's uh, we've talked at the board level about the projections and you know accounting for the revenue, et cetera. Uh, and I assume we will be addressing that. And I think there's also an extra wrinkle uh, with the uh, with the RTA uh, in terms of their uh, what they may retain from the federal funds that they're supposed to pass through to us uh, in general speak, you know, speaking. So I, I assume there'll be some dialogue about both of those. Um, in this in this budget packet, there will because we do have assumptions for um, the funding levels that we will be getting for capital, and that will factor some assumptions related to that into the budget. So we would have an opportunity to hear your comments and and thoughts on that. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, I guess then next is the uh, 4.4, the CEO report. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Brian. Given the time, I would say that the report was in the packet and would be happy to answer any questions anyone had about the specifics. Any questions on the CEO report? Kathleen? Sorry, my picture kept bouncing around. I couldn't unmute. Um, I, mine is just more of a thank you. I was reading about the critical technology enhancement that you guys have done, and uh, the, especially the onboard communication uh, that drivers are able to, to now communicate amongst themselves for critical issues, but also transfer issues. As uh, someone who has, when you used the 25, used to be at Liberty and 4th Street and the 28 was way down at the Blake Transit Center. Um, sometimes you could not make your transfer, even if the driver called in to head to dispatch. So I believe that we're gonna have a higher satisfaction rate with our customers. So I'm very grateful, thank you. Thank you, anybody else? Jesse? Uh, yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, the, the football show service, that, that, I know that's something that's been under discussion in the past. Um, could you speak a little bit to the decision to keep that going? So the, the question has arisen pretty much every year since I've been here uh, as to whether or not we would continue to do the football shuttles. And it is something that we, that Matt and I, uh, several years back, actually floated to both the city and the university that, that we were considering uh, ending uh, because of the cost and, and uh, drain on services. And the, the pushback that we got back from both the city and the university uh, to say it was large would be to, to understate it. Um, and one of the things that, that we had 
decided at that point uh, that, that Matt had decided to go forward with was, should we end that service? Should we decide to end that service that it, due to its longstanding uh, run uh, in the community, that we would wanna make sure we gave uh, a year's notice, essentially, that, that we were going to be ending that service so that we would not include it, for example, in the budget this fall. Uh, and then that would affect it for the 2020, I'm, I'm getting it, I'm, I'm, we're too close to my budget year, so I'm messing this up. Uh, but basically that, that the university and the hotels and the city would have an opportunity uh, to comment on it as part of our budget process um, as to whether or not we would end it. And coming out of the pandemic, um, rather than not do it and not provide that level of notice to the, the community uh, for something that, that is absolutely a, a, an identified community event, uh, you know, where our population uh, you know, close to doubles for a day or for about eight hours um, was not something we wanted to, to shock the system uh, for this year. Um, but it is something that is under consideration pretty much every budget year uh, as to whether or not we would want to, to continue to do it and, and certainly should be discussed as part of the assumptions that Mike and, and Nina just spoke about. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I figured that was probably it. Um, my opinions on the, the, the football shuttle have softened over the past few years, so I don't mind, but I was glad that you could speak to that. Um, the other thing, um, I, I guess you already covered, I have, I have it highlighted in my notes, that's why I'm asking, but I think you spoke, um, I continue to hear kind of disturbing reports out of Detroit, um, out of their uh, inability to get buses on the road. Uh, it seems like the kind of thing that we might be looking at as well because of the driver shortage. Um, heard a new statistic, the pullout rate, that was not one I'd heard before. Um, I just uh, would ask that you just keep us uh, Keep us informed on how that's going under the uh, the, the no surprises clause in our uh, executive limitations. I, I'm very worried about that one uh, with what we're seeing uh, across the country. So um, just would like to be can continue to be informed on that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Susan. Uh, my question is back to the football shuttles. It's analogous to the gold ride, which is it, the popularity, notwithstanding of the football shuttle, are we charging enough to cover costs? Because if people are paying upwards of $100, $200, $300 for a football ticket, $1,000 when you get a scalped Ohio State ticket, uh, my, my question is less about um, uh, uh, shocking the system this fall than right sizing the cost, and I, I resonate strongly with what Raymond said earlier, which is my priority too, is fixed route and paratransit. And anything that undercuts our financial ability to provide our service, such as the route into downtown for Ypsilanti residents to come to work, um, I, I, it, it's a question of uh, funding equity. So again, if, if we could look at the fare that's charged and not change the program for the football shuttle this year. Uh, maybe that's one way to meet it in the middle. And that gets into a, an interesting nuance of federal regulation in terms of the fares that we can charge and, and charter service. So the football shuttles are published schedules. They're open to the public and we are allowed to only charge what we would charge for a standard fair for a rider. So the $1.50 one way uh, fair is the most that we are able to charge for that service. Um, to charge any more would put us in violation of the charter regulations with the FDA. Um, uh, and it's, it's a very interesting distinction uh, due to the fact that it's the fixed route as opposed to the on-demand service because the same rule does not apply to the on-demand service and charging a premium for on-demand uh, rides. Uh, but with fixed routes, we're limited to uh, 
the, the dollar fifty a, a one way trip. Uh, I have one follow up question, and that speaks to the university and the city strongly urging us to keep it, which is if the, there is such keen interest, could we work with them to restructure the traffic pattern after the game so that our buses get priority? Because they're sitting in traffic with all the other cars. If it is such an important uh, asset to the university and to the city, and everybody is tailgating anyway, uh, other major uh, uh, arenas have prioritized shuttles, uh, have prioritized transit. And rather than have our buses sitting in traffic with everyone else, as we're looking to get people away from the stadium after the game, um, I would urge us to work with the university and the city to prioritize transit. So they are the first guests who get to get back to their hotel uh, and everyone else can be tailgating. Uh, that I think would reflect their own interest in these shuttles. Again, otherwise those guests are, are sitting or standing on those buses in traffic with everybody else. We should have high occupancy lanes that serve these buses after the game. And, and I 100% agree. Uh, we have uh, attempted every year that I've been here to work with the city and the university and the, the various, uh, really it's an all hands on deck. So you, you end up seeing, uh, state, county, and city and university uh, police um, on scene to, to assist with traffic. Um, and we have, every year I've been here, done our, our best to voice that as, a, as the, an ideal option uh, and we'll continue to do so. Roger. Yeah, um, Brian, uh, this shuttle service uh, serves the hotels. I assume that all the hotels it serves are within our service area. Yes, we don't leave our service area uh, for, for any of the, the hotel. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, right now, we tentatively, in turn, well, we'll close section four or four, uh, section five. Any emergent issues that didn't make it on the agenda that we need to know about? Okay. Uh, section six, then closing items. We do have the board retreat tentatively scheduled for August 12th, uh, and then another board meeting on the 19th. Uh, we we may wait until the CEO is back full time uh, to have that. So I think stay tuned. We will probably have a decision about whether or not to postpone that within the next few days. So we may we may be uh, postponing that until Matt is back. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, if anybody has any strong opinions about it one way or the other, let me know. Roger. Yeah. Yeah, I would strongly recommend that we. Um, since I was a pusher of the retreat that we delay it until the CEO is able to attend. Um, and I also would uh, um, recommend that uh, the agenda for the retreat uh, be put on the agenda of the service committee. Um, I know it's not exactly clear what the agenda is and I think the service committee would, uh, um, would welcome the opportunity to um, craft the agenda for the retreat. Okay. Forrest, do you have a comment? Uh, thanks. Uh, just to clarify, uh, Matt and I did discuss this before uh, he went on vacation. So he decided to join us on August 12th uh, while he's off. Uh, he's okay with that. So we are planning to have that for retreat on August 12th. And I've been working with the consultants try to uh, you know, kind of make an outline for the agenda. Uh, Roger, certainly we can discuss at the service committee. I think it's one of the agenda items uh, on the committee. Yeah, I think for us, we're, I, at least I'm aware that, that Matt did volunteer to break his vacation off to do this. And I think that's the question that uh, we need to resolve, which is do, do we want Matt to do that? Do we want him to be back full time before we do this? 
And I guess, you know, as long as we're bringing it up and talking about it, I, I guess I wouldn't mind hearing from other board members about that. Uh, would you be in favor of continuing with August 12th as scheduled or do people want to push it back until Matt is back in the chair full-time, back in the office full-time? Mike? Yeah, I, I think it would be most appropriate to wait until Matt is back full-time and to uh, hearing Roger's um, statement about the agenda and the service committee, I think the service committee is a good place to discuss it. And certainly I'm, it, should, it should involve all the planning that has already gone, gone on in terms of talking about different ways to do it. Thank you, Kyra. Yeah, I, I agree with Roger and Mike. I'd be in favor of postponing until Mac Matt is available full time, especially given that the retreat is in, you know, three to four weeks or scheduled for three to four weeks, I think more time so that everybody, including Matt is on the same page and up to speed makes the most sense to get the most out of this retreat. So, Others? Uh, sorry, can I just add on one thing? I, I think of the, the project of the long range plan project timeline uh, depends on this retreat, uh, how soon we can get it, uh, feedback from the board. And we're also planning another one. This is uh, talking, you know, kind of initial solutions, but in about a, three, four weeks after this retreat, we're hoping to get uh, additional feedback from the board members, um, you know, preliminary options before we go to public. But that's, you know, if we if we postpone this way, it may affect the project schedule, um, or may affect the uh, the one we're planning for uh, for September. Uh, just something to uh, to keep in mind. So if we if we delayed the one we have currently scheduled for August twelfth by a month. Um, Well, I guess that it's, it's uh, I mean, is there something that's gonna happen in the next three or four weeks that we couldn't get something started? In other words, are you planning to have us make decisions at the August 12th meeting that will, that have a pretty tight schedule in terms of their launch date or some other implementation process that we need to make? So in other words, if we, you know, are we gonna be making, missing some critical deadlines if we don't, have and make some decisions at this August 12th meeting. Uh, so uh, in other words, if we had the meeting itself and we, we couldn't reach a decision about some of the long range planning effort, that would it seem would have the same effect. So, you know, is that is that part of the agenda? Because I mean, to Roger's point, the agenda is not clear to us and that, that piece you just threw in for us about, you know, hey, this could delay some projects if we don't make some decisions, you know, I think that's kind of new information to the board at this point. I apologize for not being clear. Um, so the project is going to, you know, the plan for public engagement, that around public engagement is before Thanksgiving. So that's almost a hard deadline for the consultants to get options uh, ready uh, to show public. Uh, if we delay that, that will push us to probably two, three months delay because next round uh, public engagement is scheduled for February, uh, late in January. So if we delay this round two public engagement, and then we'll have to delay round three, that will push us probably to the summer. Um, it, those are kind of a critical timelines because we want to hear from the board uh, about, you know, preliminary options, solutions before we go to public. Uh, if we don't get your input, so we can still proceed uh, with public engagement, but that will be tricky because you haven't seen it. You know, what if you have some, you know, major concerns about the proposed options? Um, so then we will have to delay the public engagement. Uh, we initially said we're gonna finish this project you know, March, April, 2022. If we delay, we would probably delay to summer. Uh, and then we also have a millage plan, uh, you know, millage vote uh, in August, 2022. So 
So all this project timeline, we have to kind of work together. When when is the next when is the next service committee meeting? What what date is that? Does anybody know? Yeah, it's uh, August fourth, I believe. Okay, so I mean, Forrest, is it? I mean, are you? Um, I mean, you don't have to swear to it, but I mean, are, is it your plan that you and Matt will have an agenda ready for Roger and the service committee to review by August 4th and that Matt will be sufficiently prepped to fully participate in the board retreat by August 12th? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, that's uh, that's the plan for for this board retreat. Right. Well, given that and the timeline that they've set up for this, does anybody, Roger, Kyra, anybody else, Mike, does that change your opinion about having it or delaying it? Kathleen or anybody else? For me, I think that if Mr. Carpenter um, wishes to come back for our August 12th meeting and has been very gracious to come back and that Mr. Yang can get the materials that we need, I would hate to set back the plan. I think it's going to cause a lot of issues for staff. Um, so I, I'm open to both suggestions. I'm not gonna say, oh, we have to do it the 12th, but I'm leaning towards the 12th just when I think about staff workload and things like that, and Mr. Carpenter's willingness to come back. Others, anybody who hasn't gotten a chance to speak yet? Jesse or Raymond or Ryan, any opinion? No. I'm I'm happy to follow staff's guides, and it sounds like there's a preference from staff uh, to keep it on the scheduled date. Um, I don't want to affect, I don't want to have a negative impact on their work and timelines that they've planned out. So um, my preference would be to keep it as scheduled. Okay. Mike? Yeah, I, I think Forrest's latest comments have perhaps uh, persuaded me otherwise. Um, understanding the schedule ahead of time, uh, what will get backed up, and I particularly would be sensitive, I think, to interfering with work that could need to, to be done on the on the millage renewal or millage expansion, and of course, uh, what we would be talking. One thing that I hope we would be talking about in this retreat or maybe the next retreat is is that very thing and so i th i think i've changed my mind on that does anybody still feel strongly about delaying it at this point roger um, no if if forrest is ready to bring an agenda to the service committee and and ready for a robust discussion of the agenda um sure i'll go along with it anybody object all right, we'll, we'll keep it on the agenda then for August 12th and uh, with the caveat that we have a full agenda prepared for the service committee to review. Um, now, I mean, that will not give the full board, I mean, the service committee will see it. Hopefully they'll hammer out something that's acceptable to the service committee that they can recommend then to pass around for the full board well in advance of the retreat. Uh, of the August 12th retreat, it's gonna be a short, very quick turnaround. So I, I, I hope we can uh, push through that. Uh, so a fully fleshed out agenda uh, can be reached and everybody has a chance, everybody, not just the service committee, but the whole board has a chance to weigh in on it. That'll be a quick turnaround, but um, I'm fine with that. So we'll keep it on the schedule and, and plan to proceed on the 12th. Uh, then we have our next board meeting on the 19th, uh, as you see there. Any other questions or concerns? If not, we'll go back to item 6-2, which is public comment. Uh, Keith, uh, you know, if anybody from the public, uh, do we have anybody who wishes to uh, 
talk to the board at this point. Again, if you have any uh, comments or questions for the board, you can weigh in for up to three minutes. Please uh, click the raise hand icon if you're zooming in or star nine if you're on the phone. Keith, do we have anybody who wants to address the board at this time? Thank you, Chairman Mahler. Yes, we do. We have Mr. Jim Mogensen. Mr. Mogensen, you've been unmuted. Yes. <clears throat> so um, a, a number of years ago, um, I went to a University of Michigan, I might have been what, what is now called the Ford Policy School, and it was about governance, and I talked about metrics in the public sector. And uh, in my question comment speech, I um, uh, explained how one could manipulate the metrics in the public sector and how that could be a problem with that approach. And after the uh, lecture was over, I got mobbed by people in the public sector wanting me to explain how to manipulate the situation, the manipulate the metrics and, and, and that kind of stuff. I think they misunderstood my point, but um, could have become a consultant, I guess, again. Um, when I was listening to the bylaws, I figured out how to manipulate the situation. If someone was really angry at what the AATA was doing, and because this is a recorded session, I'm not going to explain what, what I was thinking about or, or how I was going to do that. But I just want to let you know there are, there are, there are some potential um, hazards that may happen in the future. Um, I also want to bring up the importance of doing the Title VI analysis in, at the beginning of the planning process and having it as part of the planning process at the beginning. I will tell you that the consultant's report on the um, route uh, uh, changes I found um, lacking in that it did not include the route changes, uh, uh, the route, the route, uh, the routing changes that were made uh, during the pandemic and then carried over um, in, into the new plan. Um, and that, and I, and I was uh, sad about that. Um, finally, I'll say that. Um, that the, um, there are some other emerging issues in the background. You're having the nonprofits um, 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 instead of the AATA uh, qualify people for low income status. And this is becoming an issue in the nonprofit world. So I just kind of bring it up. They have the same challenges. Um, and also fair media. There's a difference between fair change and fair media. And there are some potential fair media changes in the in the offing that have impacts on low income, low income people and need to be part of the conversation in a, in a real way. So sorry to be such a downer, but uh, thank you all for your service and um, I will um, uh, see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Keith, do we have anybody else? We do. We have uh, Mr. Robert Belowski. Mr. Belowski, you've been unmuted. Me again. So I want to go back on to what Forrest said about the BRT line, Washtenaw. In my opinion, I think it's needed now because of all the ridership now and all the businesses and all the college students coming off, going to school, going to the hospital and connecting to local businesses. It's definitely needed now. I, I understand that you guys have a you guys are running a study on it to see if it's you know usable. I think, in my opinion, that it needs to roll out, I think, you know, maybe in a year or so, because you know, a lot more people are taking the bus. And you know, it's something that's need I mean, it's something that's needed definite in this area, especially on Washington. Grand Rapids is the only one in this state that has BRT lines and they're all across the city and they're somewhat of a college town and they've got them scattered across the city. That's why that city is so much easier to connect than anywhere else within the state. Can you guys maybe get one? Yeah, will it probably be a lot better in terms of ridership and crowded buses? I could say half and half on that, but honestly, I get the study, but I think it's definitely needed within one to two years, at least, 
and maybe this one will beat Grand Rapids and have, you know, a college town like Ann Arbor, you know, have an easier connection unlike Grand Rapids. We can beat them. I think we can, but you know, that will take time and, you know, I'll be looking forward to it, but you know, it'll, it'll come, it'll come when, as soon as you get the studies, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, to conclude, I want to welcome Susan to the board and um, good luck on your journey out with the board for you know all this stuff because they are a really great board and they you know they keep our system going and i want to welcome you but other than that i hope you guys have a good rest of your night take care now thank you keith do we have anybody else yes we do we have ms michelle barney ms barney you've been unmuted Thank you. This idea of changing the way the gold, the gold ride is done is, I think, the worst thing for the people. Now, I'm not a gold rider. I'm an A rider, but I did have gold ride years ago. And I've also run across gold ride people by virtue of just talking to other folks who have mobility problems. But for some reason, a doctor doesn't judge them severe enough to qualify for the ADA. There are, there are many, many people who, the, the first thing is they, there are many people who cannot afford $10 for a ride to go somewhere and who are gonna have to cut back on doctor visits and other important things. The other thing is that I have five friends who are not disabled but who were not able, they, they work at odd hours or they work late, at, they work early in the morning, like a shift that starts at 5 a.m. at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital. So they can't, they're, they're healthy enough to use fixed ride, but they can't use it because it doesn't run where they have to go at that hour. Or the routes have been changed or canceled during the pandemic. So they made deals with, um, with, with the private companies. They found them very undependable, even when they had an agreement that you must be at my house at, let's say, 4.15 every morning, five days a week, and pay them like that. Pay them normal wages that, that you pay those folks. Um, and, they act, and they eventually had to find private individuals who needed the money who would come and, and get them to their jobs on time. Be very, if you do it, be very careful and strict with the rules for, for the companies you're going to choose to contract with because they're not dependable. And I'm really sorry this is going to hurt. And yes, I suspect you will have reaction at the ballot box when you ask for millage for money for, for continued A ride or continued AATA. And you certainly will not expand AAATA this way. I've noticed that things are getting a lot better. Whatever it is, whether it's the new electronic equipment, it seems to get me much better responses from the, from the phone folks that I have to call about route information or rides. or It, it all seems to be a lot better. So thank you. That's all. Thank you. Keith, do we have anybody else? No, 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 no,